Hallelujah. Oh my, oh my. It's good to see you guys tonight. Um, we're we're going to just press into uh, the place of His presence for, for just a bit. And I know that this is kind of different Thursday evening uh, gathering. Hey, Pastor, how you doing? It's good to see you. Got the guys here from Brenham? <laughs> Coming on down, that's awesome. Um, we're just going to spend some time just pressing into the things. You know, it's a Thursday night. You could be doing, uh, I don't know, lots of things, but you're not. You're here, right? So we're here for one, for one real good reason, and that's to love on Him. And so I, I want to I wanna take our first time together tonight and just proclaim, Father, we love you above all else, and we have determined to declare uh, your goodness in the land of the living. And Father, we just uh, take this opportunity to lift our voice and to magnify your holy name. Lord, we just want to, uh, yeah, let's do this. Stand to your feet. And how about just giving us a shout in the house tonight? Hallelujah! with the password of thanksgiving tonight and we enter into that place of praise in you for you alone are worthy amen amen hallelujah so uh i believe danny's leading us tonight good to see everybody say hey danny good stuff so we're gonna uh, bless him and just go on in glory That the Lord is good. So 
remembered forever. Your mercy will be remembered forever. Your mercy will be remembered forever. Your mercy will be remembered for. Keep singing it. Your mercy will be remembered forever. Your mercy will be remembered forever. Your mercy will be remembered forever. Your mercy will be. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever.
worship. Lord, that our heart full of praise for you, God, would just fill this place. It would fill our hearts, God. It would fill our families. It would fill our homes. Jesus, it would fill the workplace, Lord. That it would stretch to the ends of the earth, God. That your glory would cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. I just want to encourage you right now if we can just begin to praise the Lord and thank Him. You don't need to shout. I just feel this kind of holy thing in the room that we would just begin to, out of your own mouth, proclaim who He is to you. In every season, in every trial, in every circumstance of life, He is good. He is full of mercy. He is kind. He is loving. He is my Savior. He is my friend. He is my Father. Jesus, just begin to tell him who he is so he can tell you who you are right now. Just all over the room in your own words.
You know just what to do
human's purpose One main reason for existence No man's pain and high ambition
the first place and that in all things you would have preeminence sing that in all and that in all things you would have your glory God all is for your glory put me in dangerous to sing <laughs> if you really mean them <laughs> that's a dangerous song put me anywhere <laughs> huh hear what you're singing <laughs> father thank you for dangerous songs God, just burrow those dangerous songs deep in our heart. Let them take root. Let them have meaning. Lord, beyond just the articulation of our mouth. Yeah, let them have root. I'll go anywhere.
Father, I thank you for bringing uh, Olivia to us tonight. Lord, I thank you for this message, God, that she's carrying for our children, our children's children, and our children's children's children. And Lord, we just receive her tonight. God, we receive the word of life that she is carrying. God, we open our ears to hear. We open our hearts to receive. And we submit our hands and our feet to do. God, what you speak through this woman of God. Blessing, glory, honor, and praise. You know, normally right now we would, you know, make announcements, talk about the conference, receive the offering, do all that, but I think that would be inappropriate for the moment. I, I think the stage, so to speak, is set of our heart, the platform of our heart to receive the word. So we're just going to move right into that right now. And I want you to give a good freedom welcome to Olivia Soup as she comes to Come on. Put it up. Put it up. You're okay down here? Okay. She says she's all right here. Come on. Can, can, you, can you say howdy? Can you give her a Texas howdy? <laughs> all right. Yeah, that was awesome worship. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. Um, I am so excited to be in Texas. Jeff and I always say, whenever we're frustrated with California laws, we always say, we're moving to Texas. <laughs> about every week. Um, <laughs> I was just actually, I was thinking about that. Our son, Christian, is in, he's our middle son. I have four children. Um, the oldest one, Anna, is 19, going to be 20. And then Wesley is 18, a senior. And then Christian's 15. And Joshua is 13. And Christian... We did not let him go to, he goes to a secular preparatory school, and uh, we did not let him go to Planned Parenthood sex education over the last few weeks. <laughs> we pulled him out in the morning for, I guess it was a period and a half long. But anyway, um, what they did was they then assigned him Saturday school for missing school. So he got detention for missing Planned Parenthood. How's that for learning to stand strong as a kid? Um... But what was interesting is two years ago, when this particular school brought in Planned Parenthood, I really felt like the Lord said, do not send your kids. And, you know, they don't want to be different, but I felt like the Lord, it would make them stronger. So Wesley, I said, Wes, um, we'll come get you. We'll take you to Starbucks, whatever, but we don't want you to go to Planned Parenthood sex education. And we, we explained to him they perform more abortions than any other abortion provider in the United States. And that week, Dobson was doing a whole special on Planned Parenthood and all about what they're doing and what their agenda is. So Wesley got to watch it. But he was, it was hard for him, but I said, Wesley, I want you to watch. By the end of the week, God's going to show you something about us going to Starbucks that, um, that he's blessing you, even though you're uncomfortable for listening to your parents on this. And there were only like four or five kids out of 120 that didn't go. And uh, at the end of the week, there was a school... Um, I want to say ceremony. That's not what you have. What do you have in high school when all the kids? Assembly. Thank you. <laughs> ceremony. <laughs> Assembly. <laughs> and um, they called out kids, and they were giving away like $50 Starbucks cards. And wouldn't you know, they called out Wesley and gave him a $50 Starbucks card. <laughs> and that's where he was during Planned Parenthood. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. But Christian, who is very confident, I think he thought, well, my brother's doing that. He didn't even care. He, did, he was like, can we go to Starbucks? I don't care about missing Planned Parenthood. And um, so he's at Saturday school for missing planning here. And the principal walks by and I said, Christian, I said, you're going to be in there for three hours. And the principal really said, Miss Shoup, I'm so sorry. Like she said, I really respect you guys. This is just school policy. So, um, so he's in Saturday school. He took Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. How many of you have read that? Anyway, what Christian is so hilarious. I was like, why don't you take a classic? Why don't you take this adventure story? I'm like coming up with all these books. And he goes, no, I'm reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So, and the principal went, mine, she's like, look at it, what he's reading. I said, what, when he got out, I said, what'd you learn, Christian? He said, well, number one, he said, uh, with the wealthy, their money works for them, and with the poor, they work for their money. And he told me that. And he said, and the second principle is, 
I, Dad can't say we can't afford that anymore because he's supposed to say to us, when we say we want this, he shouldn't say we can't afford that. He needs to say, how can we afford that, Christian? <laughs> Think creative. It was so funny. He's, I have so many hilarious stories about my middle son and finances. I'll tell you all more in a little bit. Um, so anyway, what I want to do first is I was thinking of the movie Emma. Most of you probably haven't said that, seen that unless you're a woman and a BBC fanatic. But um, in the movie, the father says to um, his children that are older, he said, you have not known fear until you've had children. <laughs> and I thought, amen. <laughs> Teenagers is what I thought immediately. I really wasn't afraid of them falling down. But when they got to be teens, I was like, whoa, my hair is turning gray. Um, so what I want is to pray first. I want you guys to just for a minute pray and ask the Lord. I want you to listen to his answer. <clears throat> I'm going to pray this. Jesus, who is responsible for our children? What, what did he say? He is. I tell you, I pray that and I think, I cannot hear, I can't hear, I can't hear, I can't hear. Because you think, I think, somehow I think I am. And yes, we do have responsibility to partner with him. And we're going to hear about things that, that we do need to do as parents. But I want to start off there. He is responsible for your kids. When one of our kids was just not using their brain very well a couple of years ago, I was praying with someone doing some inner healing. And I saw... Um, and when you learn the brain science, that their brain, the frontal lobes that are responsible for risk, risk assessment and common sense do not develop till 26, then you start understanding. <laughs> They're not fully developed till 26. So anyway, I saw this huge hand, like the Lord. I mean, it was, it was like, a, it came, I saw it, and she was like this little person in this big hand, and the Lord showed me that he had her in his hand, and that I was not ultimately responsible for keeping her on track, getting her back on track, fixing her, all of that stuff that we want to do as parents. The key to parenting is for you guys that are parents to be fully confident that Jesus is with you and that he's there to help you. And we are not to live in fear. Even though when you look out there, it can get pretty scary nowadays. But the key to everything in life is relationship with Jesus. Everything. Everything. That's the key. And trusting the Lord with your kids. Just trusting the Lord and then doing what, doing your part, doing what he says. We have to be like children about our children. <laughs> we have to trust him that he wants them to get where they're supposed to be more than we do. So that's my starting place is just to trust Jesus with your kids. Um, and parenting nowadays has become extremely complex out there. There's a lot of polarization a lot of information, and people are, it's, they're like ping pong balls. There's so much information coming at the complexity is making it difficult to see what we're supposed to do. And Jesus wants to take that complexity and make it simple. He wants to make parenting simple. Um, so I think I was talking to Susan. She called and said, they, I said, what do you want me to do in my session? She said, how about how to parent? And I thought, how about how not to parent? I can do that. <laughs> it can make you all feel better. I have so many bloopers, um, but I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, told you have four kids, um, and my husband's name is Jeff. Um, we moved to Bethel about 11 years ago, and um, this is the strangest thing. that someone from Focus on the Family here, but Focus on the Family started coming. I had never ordered it before. I loved Dobson, watched his stuff, but I've never ordered their magazine, and it, would, it started coming every day, like so the fifth day, I was like, this is bizarre, the same magazine. And then the words would come off the page at me. Like, you know, not literally, but they just, and focus on the family. Focus on the family. So I finally got it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a parenting family thing out of our home. So I started class out of our house, and it grew so big, and everybody wanted to be in it. And so then we decided to do it at the church, and I went and asked the church leadership. And they said, oh, we know you and Jeff. We'd love for you to do this. So the first year, it was like 120 moms. And then when they'd come with husbands, it was even more. And we, so we had some, sometimes we'd have moms because it was in the morning and they were at work. And then certain sessions, we'd have husbands and wives. Because how many of you know, like, um, if the wife is trying to implement something and the husband's not on the same page, it creates actually more conflict than if she'd never come to a class. 
So what we tried to do is encourage the husbands to read the stuff too and come to the sessions and do it and get learn together and grow together so we weren't, so I wasn't creating conflict by teaching the wives something and then they're like, why aren't you doing that? Does that make sense? So we really encourage the unity is really important in working as a team. So anyway, then I started that. Then it led, and then the Lord started showing me this book, which I've written, and um, I would get, he would highlight chapters to me, and <laughs> there's 75,000 parenting books out there. Do you guys know that? No wonder it's polarized and complex. There's 75,000 parenting books. When some of the, my favorite parents are raising their kids, there was nothing. Like they had old reel-to-reel tapes. Now there's 75,000 parenting books. And, um, and they're telling, you know, I'm <laughs> just thinking they one day, dec- and every decade it changes. Like I wanted to write a book. I felt like the Lord wanted me to write a book that was the 10,000-foot view, and it wasn't based on trends. You know, every t- decade, they're, you know, spank, then the next decade, just don't spank, then it's back to spank, then it's praise your kids, don't praise them too much, make sure they're comfortable, no, make sure they work hard. It's like chocolate and coffee, are they good for us or not? You know, we just, all the parenting stuff is just so, and, it, and all the information makes the parents actually less confident, more ambivalence. Because if you're, if you're confused and you don't know what, you're just not going to do anything. It's better to go back to when there weren't any much and you just do something at least and stick with it. So all of that was out there. And so what I did was I, the Lord would highlight different things to be, to write chapters on. But then I've gone out and I spent four years interviewing people like in their 70s. And I said, what do you see in our culture that we're not doing? And what do you, just things we're not doing, what do you think we're doing right? What are things we're missing in our culture? And I I did research on Olympic parents to see how do they produce Olympians? How do people that produce these exceptionally talented kids, how do they raise them? Because I'm very interested in, um, raising kids to be great like I really believe there's greatness in every kid so I wanted to get those nuggets from people that raise those Josephs where they're great at this and then they go out and they impact the world because we're so excellent so I did a lot of research on that um and probably 10 years of just studying and different things and then um I, Jeff goes, you need to tell people it's 12 books in one. I said, well, it is kind of 12 books in one. Because if you, at the end of every chapter, if there's something you're interested in, like there's all these books you could read. But what I did is certain books only had a few good nuggets in it, so I just take those out and put them in. And then other books, I think they're well worth reading. So I put that in there, like, you should read this if you're interested in this. But anyway, I want to read you all some of the, the, um, the uh, um, chapter titles, and I'm going to give a book away. Okay. So the first two chapters are on relational parenting, which we're going to talk about. Uh, Relational parenting and communication. Then I did a chapter on excellence versus performance parenting, which is really about authoritarian and 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 performing out of performing out of knowing who you are or out of a need to measure up. And talking about the difference in pushing your kid toward excellence or producing performance kids. And what's so funny when that chapter came out three years ago, it started circulating Dallas. I don't know why. Maybe there's a lot of competitive parents there or something. But anyway, um, raising overcomers. And then that's a whole chapter on teaching kids to overcome in an age-appropriate way. Most great people have learned to overcome. And our society is obsessed with comfort. So what I want to do is talk about how can you teach your kids to overcome, not in a traumatic way, but in an age-appropriate way. So when they grow up, they can overcome. They can stand against things without falling apart. Um, then finding the God zone in your kid is all about finding their personal passions and where their personal passion meets what they're actually really gifted at. Because if they have personal, my son Christian has a personal passion for a lot of things he's not gifted at. So he's tried sport after sport after sport, and he's finally finding his niche. But it's talking about basically tips to find what they love, where what they love intersects with what they're really good at. So that's a chapter on that. Then perseverance. And my friend from Panama just wrote me. She goes, Olivia, I am exhorted but not crushed. She goes, I just read Developing Perseverance. I signed my kids up for a piano and something else. I thought it was so cute. She just sent me that she was encouraged but not crushed. I said, I didn't want you to be even close to crushed. But anyway, um, raising risk takers, and that's talking about raising kids who can handle risk. Our culture is hilarious about risk and comfort. I mean, I saw an ad for baby knee pads for, and it said something like, so when children go from the carpet to the tile, they will not hurt themselves. I'm like, what are they going to do? Go skidding around out, flying sparks from their diapers as they cross over? I mean, 
What kind of comfort, obsession with comfort is that? Or, or the labels on the ironing board, do not iron clothes when you're in them. Like who would iron? Or make sure you open stroller before you place child in. I mean, the, the risk, the, the comfort, and the making sure we don't mess up, and the, it's just, we've gone crazy. But anyway, all right. Raising risk takers and successful failures, and that's also tips on teaching them how to fail. You really have to teach kids that it's the practicing it. It's not important if they do great, it's if they keep trying new things. So teaching them to fail is very important too. And then balancing protection and freedom, that's a whole chapter. I think we've gone so overboard in the area of feeling like we have to give our kids so much freedom and that, oh, protecting them's bad and, and sheltering them's bad. And there's a balance about age appropriate protection and, and protecting them and freedom. So that's a whole chapter on that about media too. Um, education intelligence, I did a whole chapter on finding your kids learning intelligence. I did a lot of research on that and how they learn best and how to identify that and, and, and help them to love learning. Um, and then inwardly grateful, it's an outwardly focused about cultivating kids who serve. And then I did a chapter on achievement, obsession, or character cultivation. Um, and then don't let the church take your job is really about spiritually equipping your own kids and like having, not depending on the church to do what you should do at home. But anyway, who would like a copy? Here, I saw your thing first. <laughs> um, anyway, so, and then, and then when I got done with it, I was like, oh, I forgot to ask Bill to do the foreword. And Bill, like, there's 3,000 churches under Bethel now, and like 500 uh, people ask him every year for a foreword, because all these churches, people write a book, they ask Bill. And I said, I'm not going to ask Bill, especially like, I, I didn't do it early enough. And Jeff goes, he's going to say yes, ask him. So, I mean, like a month before I was done, I wrote Bill, and I said, hey, this is Olivia, <laughs> your friend. Uh, I said, <laughs> I'm almost finished my book, and I asked him, and he, he wrote back, I definitely want to do it for you. It was so sweet. Yeah, Jeff was right. He usually is. Um, and then when I was in the middle of it, like it was so much research and work, and I have four kids that I have this Christmas prophetic party for Raising Tomorrow's Leaders once a year where we bring in teams and they prophesy over every single mom. And, and when they, the teams come in from second year, they don't know that I'm, I'm the one who started Raising Tomorrow's Leaders. And the first thing they said to me is, I literally that day asked the Lord, can I just put this off? I don't want to finish this book. It's too much of a burden. I can't do it. And the person, the second year student said right away, I see words falling around you. Are you in the middle of writing a book? And then he said, and the Lord said, now is the time. I was like, whoa, okay. And then this next year I was almost finished, same thing happened to me. So it was, it's just been an amazing thing. So this is, and I wrote it for you guys. It's not a money maker to me. It's just a blessing. I, it's something I did as obedient to the Lord and to bless the church. Um, but the backdrop of the, of the book basically is principles that work. They're going to work in rapidly changing times that we live in. But also a backdrop that you see all the way through the book is that your kids are going to become a lot like you. So when you break through and you get inner healing, your personal development will affect a lot the result you have with your children. And so each at the end of every chapter, it's like, do you persevere? Can you take risk? It gives you places to ask those things and discuss them with your group. And then, at the end, and then it also has something, and a lot of churches are doing this with men and women together and grandparents. And one of the things you do is you tell your spiritual journey to your small group. So you tell how you're raised, not blaming your parents, but just talking about how you're raised, telling your story. And this is what the brain science says. When you tell your story, literally your brain recalibrates and you actually get healing just from telling your story to an empathetic listener. So we're seeing breakthrough, just people sharing how they were raised and light bulbs going on. So anyway, enough about that. Um, and I have a newsletter clipboard that I'll put out with the... Um, books later. It's just for if you want. I send out a newsletter every couple months and it has like a new article or it might have a movie recommendation or a book list recommendation if you guys want to sign up for that. It's not, we don't send out a lot of stuff, but it sends you new information that I'm writing. Um, I was going to share a little bit about me first, talking about how we parent is shaped by our past, how we are parented, the choices that we make, um, by the information or misinformation that we receive, by the healing we get or don't get. Well, I was raised um, in an atheist home, 
and my dad became a Christian later, but he, his dad was a judge, and uh, he didn't know if God existed, and he married my mom, who, um, my dad was very brilliant, he studied in a bunch of schools, and ended up teaching at Cornell University, he speaks like 10 languages, and then my mom was from a Catholic home with nine children in Belgium, her dad built a lot of the roads in Belgium and France, and um, she was raised like Sound of Music before Maria, pre-Maria, okay? <laughs> The maids told her, clean this, do that. And I mean, she just, she was raised by the maids and they weren't allowed to talk at the dinner table. So she married my dad thinking, freedom, right? She's coming over to the States and they pretty much disowned her in the Catholic Church for marrying an American Methodist. But she moved over here and they got married. And I remember they found pot growing in our backyard in Illinois. And they're like, oh, what's this? So I, when I grew, when I was like four, we had brownies, like half the brownies had the pot in them and half of the brownies didn't. Or that's the side you can eat from, Olivia. Okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, and my mom said, well, I didn't know what pot was. And she probably actually didn't. So they joined the hippie movement to like, just kind of, they, my mom was really feeling free. And then... They raised me on Dr. Spock, which I would say is the father of the permissive movement, although he renounced it at the end of his life. So I was raised on Dr. Spock, excess freedom. And I remember just there being kind of a void of truth. And I remember I was always a question asker, still am. I asked lots of questions. And uh, I asked my mom and dad, Where, what happens when you die at four? I mean, I went and I said, what happens when you die? And she just said, nothing. I remember walking off and a hopelessness in my stomach, like a pit. It was just like, you just die? Like, that's it? And I mean, that set me in this hopeless, lonely place. It like planted a lie there. And the enemy will try to plant a lie in our lives where the truth would do them the most harm. So here I am, hopeless, scared, alone. And every time I would hear ambulances, I would be petrified. And I thought about that. I'm like, that's why I used to be petrified when I heard ambulances. You know, I'd be just like, ah, because I thought you, they're dying and then nothingness, you know, from that. So it's so cool. I don't know why I didn't notice this till a couple of years ago, but, you know, God always wants the next generation to break through. He's always moving, moving in our generations. And my son, Joshua Caleb, number four, when he was, let's see, three years old, he was in the back seat and he was like, la, 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 la. And I saw an ambulance and it was coming and I heard the sirens and he was singing and he goes, whoop, mommy, whoop. And he was pointing, he goes, there come the angels, like that. I mean, there is no way. I mean, he was pointing and watching them come down. There they are, coming down to the ambulance. So, I mean, I thought about that. It took me years to get, like, that's the Lord's redemption from every generation. Here I was petrified. I didn't do anything to make that happen. He just was moving in that next generation already. And so then, so anyway, we were raised real permissive, and whatever we wanted to do, we could do. And my parents, I went to first grade, I think, and we went to school just like every other day in Colorado. And my parents bought a VW van and stuccoed it. And then my sister, we lived in the VW stuccoed van, and um, my sister was in class, like kindergarten. They said, where do you live? And she said, we, I, well, we live in the Grand National Park. And the teacher said, you tell the truth right now. <laughs> Poor, my sister's like traumatized by that. That's why she has to have everything perfect in her world now. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> she's like, we really do live in the Grand National Park right now. Um, so anyway, so then we, so every other day in school, I went skiing and uh, we went Purgatory, a place in Colorado, ski resort called Purgatory. Keep the Catholic theme going there. But uh, so then I remember in third grade, I went to the Sunshine School. This is hilarious, absolutely hilarious. My mom signs us up for the Sunshine School. There's no books, no pencils. I look back, there was nothing, not a book. And there were like eight kids. I'm like, no wonder there were only eight kids. There was no curriculum. So the only thing I remember from the Sunshine School is this teacher named Charlotte, who is not a Christian, also an atheist, took us all up into this loft, and she read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to us because it was a classic. And I remember sitting there going, oh, I wish I could know Aslan. Like, I would sit there and dream about it at that age. And he was drawing me to him. That's how, power how powerful C.S. Lewis is, too, to his credit. But then, um, so then people shared, no one shared the gospel with us, which is interesting, till about high school. And then 
a family came and shared. We lived in Europe. We moved around a lot after that. Lived in Europe, then came back, and then um, a family led us to the Lord in high school. And I literally was one of those kids. I did not. I thought Psalms was palms and Job was job, and I couldn't understand why they said Jesus, God. Does God have a son, or are they interchangeable names? I literally knew nothing of the gospel. So we, Dr. Curlin, who I'll tell you more about, he now is one of the specialists in neuro, interpersonal neurobiology, which is praying with people using brain science and helping them. He's amazing at what he does. But anyway, back then they led us to the Lord and their family discipled us. And I remember when I got saved, starting to get up at five, and I memorized lots of books in the Bible because I went to Bill Gothard. <laughs> Went to one of his, and I'm like, okay, if I memorize lots, and it actually was good. I know a lot of people have bad experiences with that, but for me, it, I learned lots of new te- different books in the Bible, and I think it actually helped me get into Wheaton College because I'd memorized so much scripture in my brain, and plus it made up for the sunshine school. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, um, we w- went to Wheaton College, and um, when, my, when I was a senior in high school, my dad, I wanted to go to Vanderbilt, and he, they were all Christians by now, and he said, you, listen, Olivia, he said, you can go to Wheaton, Wheaton, or Wheaton. Those are your three choices. So I, I went to Wheaton and loved it, thank goodness. And it's true, I was not ready to go to Vanderbilt. Like, I would have been indoctrinated. I just was not ready for that kind of environment. So it was a good thing that my dad saw that by the grace of God. And then I met my husband there, and uh, we had a professor there, I think, senior year that kind of talked about the Holy Spirit a little bit, uh, had us read Andrew Murray's book, and he would talk about, do you believe, and the, I can't remember called the baptism of the Holy Spirit or what, I don't remember how he, how he phrased it, but anyway, he got us interested, and then after we got married, after our senior year, we went, um, we decided we were going to go be missionaries in Romania, which is so funny to me that you'd go to a missionary, and then we had, you know, our Bible in hand, that's all we had, we did not have the anointing to blow the fuzz off a peanut, we were just so... <laughs> We were so frozen chosen. I remember being at Wheaton, and I remember being at Wheaton, and people would worship, and sometimes a few people would raise their hand. Now, if you go to evangelical schools, lots of kids raise their hands. But back then, like, this is how religious I was. I was at Wheaton, and someone raised their hand in front of me, and I was like, I cannot believe they would do that. That's so irreverent and annoying to me. <laughs> They're in front of me raising their hands. Ah, that's so bad. But anyway, so we went to we went to Romania, and... Um, and God really used us there, even in the beginning. Um, and we led Christian camps and had hundreds of kids coming to the Lord every summer. And we would disciple them and put them in small groups. And we worked with orphanages and churches. And um, and then we had several of our own kids and a couple adopted kids. And Jeff would always be like, don't bring any more orphans home, Olivia. But I kept bringing them home from the big orphanage. <laughs> so, like, at one point we had nine or ten kids in our house um, that we were taking care of. And then someone gave us uh, Jack Deere's book, Surprised by the Power of the Spirit. And we read that and we're like, okay, we're missing something. And you know it when you're on the mission field. Because, like, just your Bible and it just doesn't work. And so we were like, we are powerless. So I then read the book 9 o'clock in the morning. Have you all ever heard that by Bennett or something? And then they speak with other tongues. And I was like, okay. And when I read those books, I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to pray for the baptism. And I was like all by myself. And literally when I prayed, this thing, this presence would start coming, and then I'd get scared, and so I waited a couple more days. And then I remember thinking, okay, I will, I'm willing to talk in tongues, but I will not sing in tongues. Well, that is way too weird for me. So um, literally the presence of God came up, and I was sang in tongues for two or three hours. Literally, and then I went, and I, I was picking Jeff up from, like, the train station. I went and got him, and I said, you wouldn't even believe what happened to me. I was so euphoric. Like, the, everything they said in the book was happening to me, and I was telling him all about it, and then I came home, and the kitchen was on fire, and I didn't even care. Like, I was so euphoric. It was literally in flames, and then, and then the other thing that would happen was my lips would get really hot. They would, like, burn, like, the whole time. That happened to me for, like, days, and then, so, then I go to sleep, and I go to sleep, I'm not kidding. In the middle of the night, I sat up, and I had this dream that we were at a conference with Randy Clark, some guy named Randy Clark, and he came over, and he prayed for Jeff, and Jeff fell over, hit his head on a chair in front of 2,000 people, and something really embarrassing happened to him, and that was the end of the dream. So I told Jeff, 
when we go, to, and he's hungry now, he's like, I'm not going to be outdone by my wife. So he's thinking, I am not going to let her be more. He's like, let's go check out these conferences. So we, so we came back to the States, and we called it our Holy Spirit Tour. And we came back here, and I think we, came, we went first to a conference with Peter Wagner and Cindy Jacobs. So we're at this conference. I'm not kidding. And when you're an evangelical and you come in and they're all just even praying out loud, it's intimidating. You know, I'm just like, this is embarrassing. And I thought we had signs on us like powerless or something. <laughs> That's how we felt. You know what I mean? And so, and then like I was next to these ladies who are like, they're like, come on, girl, jam out. I was like, oh my gosh, move. They were telling me like, move your feet and all this stuff. And so I, we're like close to the front. And then Peter Wagner does an altar. He says, everybody who's a missionary and a pastor come up front. So we went up front. This was horrifying to us at that point. He said, okay, you're the prayer team. He, and we looked at each other like we have never prayed for somebody like this kind of prayer that y'all do. So we were so nervous. And we're like on the, and you can't run back to your seat then. We didn't know that. that's what he was calling us up for. So we're like on the front row and this huge person comes right up to Jeff and I. And we said, we said, how can we pray for you? <laughs> and they said, just give me all you got. That is exactly what they said. And then like, we were like, okay. So like, then we like put hands on him and they're like, and then Jeff goes, Olivia. He's going down, and there's, like, no catchers. There's, like, no. We were so nervous. And then, then the next day, Jeff, so I have this dream, right? So Jeff goes, Libby, there's this guy, Randy Clark. I, I just went and heard him. He just spoke on power evangelism. And I, I don't even think he remember the dream or anything. And he said, let's go up and talk to him. So I said, okay. So we went up, and Randy was in a, like, uh, extra room doing a, what do you all call that? Those extra sessions while the main session's going? Breakout breakout session so Randy was doing a breakout session and Jeff heard him and thought he was amazing so we went up to Randy and so everyone left the room and then Randy's like well how can I pray for you guys and so we're like well we're evangelicals and we're powerless <laughs> we, like, just went, Don't. we just we want more of the Holy Spirit and he goes okay he was really sweet he goes you just put your hand he did he goes you just put your hands out like this and that's how you receive and so then he and then he had Jeff stand next to me, and so I was like this. And then as soon as he prayed for me, I, like, fell over. Like, I just felt this weight, and I fell over. Well, I didn't know this. Jeff, Jeff was, like, feeling, he was trying to figure out what was going on with me, but he didn't want to open his eyes. So he thought I might be levitating. And then, then <laughs> Randy's praying for him, and Randy said, and Jeff said, he started thinking about philosophy class at Wheaton, like Kierkegaard, and just by faith that will happen to you if you just fall. So then Jeff just, like, fell over on his own, and I don't know, this is so hilarious, Randy goes, hey, Jeff, the Holy Spirit doesn't need any courtesy drops, <laughs> and we were totally, like, how, how he knows that, just, so then Randy goes, but I want to take y'all to dinner, so Randy took us to dinner, and then Randy goes, okay, I want y'all to come to my next conference, and I'm going to give y'all tickets, and he ate dinner with us, and he said, come to my next conference, I really think y'all are supposed to be there, well, I didn't even remember the dream. So we go to the next conference and with Randy in St. Louis. And then he has this big old pastor's luncheon, and there's like 200 pastors. Well, we're standing eating lunch with the pastors, and they start doing the prophetic. And this guy who's a really crass prophetic guy who's literally not on the circuit anymore. But so we're all staying out, and he like literally points at Jeff. And he said, you know, you're really powerless. <laughs> he like told that for all the 200 pastors. <laughs> And you're struggling with being powerless. And we're like, thanks for telling everybody. And then, and then he said, and he said, and the Lord's going to shake you. And he's going to shake you and shake you and shake you till he's got you and shake that powerless out or whatever. And so I was like mad. So I went up to Randy Clark afterwards. And I said, well, Randy's like walking around. I said, Randy, that is just, I, that's what you read in the books about how they use prophetic and abusive ways. That's totally inappropriate. The way, and he goes, oh, no, 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 no. He goes, that guy was not talking to Jeff. I know who he was. He was talking to the guy behind Jeff. And then right then that prophet comes by. Oh, no, it was him. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, long story short, we go to the conference, and, we, and the guy, it was just like it really was the Lord if you hear what happens at the end. It's just the delivery was bad. But so we go to the conference, and on the very last night of the conference, their call up all the missionaries and pastors again. And, um, and at the end, I'm thinking, like, Lord, you never did the dream. 
Jeff's never been anointed, da da da, nothing's happened in the dream. I'm like really upset, so I'm in the back, I have my head down. Well, Randy goes through and he's praying, and he, when he gets to Jeff, he turns on his mic and he said, I am giving you what I have for Romania. And he's like, and he turned his mic on, he wanted everybody to hear it, and that's all I saw. So I never saw another thing until the end of the conference, because I was sitting in the back mad at God. So at the end, I find out Jeff, but the whole time Randy's going, everyone went back to their seats. I'm like, where is Jeff? He had fallen over, hit his head on a chair, and was shaking across the front all through Randy's talk for an hour and a half. So Randy would point to this person and go, just say more, Lord. I thought, I didn't know what he was pointing to, (laughs) but it was Jeff vibrating, and he was so on fire that people thought he needed deliverance. Like they came over and he was like, no, 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 no. He was seeing orphans in his mind and he was shaking all over. They had six people praying over and then, anyway. So, (laughs) so, and then I thought, you know, what is Jack Taylor? The sign of the Holy Spirit is trouble. So anyway, we went back to Romania to trouble. But anyway, um, it was great. I mean, it's been so amazing. Like after I noticed that after I, had the presence of the Holy Spirit more strongly in my life, like the scriptures opened up to me. I was memorizing all that, but I couldn't get it. Like all of a sudden, I really did get the scriptures. They made sense to me. So it's been just such an amazing journey after that, going back and forth to Romania and what God's done there. Um, and anyway, that's a little bit of our story, though, in the Holy Spirit. Um, and then we end up moving back to, we ended up moving to Reading because we have an evangelical board and we kind of lost them when we moved into the Holy Spirit stuff. So Bill adopted us at Bethel and we've loved it, loved being there. And we've, we're going back and forth to Romania. I think we'll probably end up going more later on too when more of our kids are older. But anyway, I want to transition into parenting a little bit. Um, I want you to get some tools of just hope and tools of principles, hope, any truth that would come from a testimony. Uh, I'm going to refer sometimes to Barna Group studies, and Barna Group is probably one of the most respected statisticians group, but what they did is they did this study a few years ago where they took about, I think, um, a thousand young adults that were walking with God with vibrant Christian lives, and they interviewed them, and then they interviewed them for close to a decade. Actually, I think it might be 10,000, and so they they interviewed them about how their parents parented them. And then they went and interviewed all the parents to see if it all coincided with the kids and the parents, what they were saying. So it's really, they wrote this book called Revolutionary Parenting. It's, not, it's really not what people say works, but what really does work. So as I was writing the book, I'd refer to that and go, oh, yes, the Barna Group shows this, actually. So it's a cool study. They're very amazing. But um, I want you to keep this in mind. Romans, Matthew 11. 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, some of you are going to hear some of these principles and go, oh, I'm great at that. And other ones are going to be like, I have principles that I don't do very well that I wrote on, and I have principles that I do really well. Like, I feel like it's a strength of mine, and I have other areas that are weaknesses. Um, but the first thing I want to stress is every family is different. There's no normal is a setting on the dryer. Other than that, there's no normal. Like, your family is, some families are loud, extrovert. Our family, like, they kept saying, oh, you're going to have a laid-back one next to have four. Like, no one's laid back in our house. Like, everybody's kind of loud and type A a little bit. And so, um, but some families are quieter. They like science and math. And other families, like, are strong leaders. Some people like to serve. You don't need to compare your family. You realize your family's unique. Let God shape your vision. And I think the enemy likes to get us into idealism. Because why does he want us to have, have wrong ideals about our family? Like to have, see things only in ideals. Because he can get you to have unrealistic expectations. And then you have unrealistic expectations, you're going to be dissatisfied. Like I used to think our family's going to be like the Waltons. Good night, John Boy. Good night, so-and-so. And we would all say good night. And then I thought, this is so crazy, but I thought we'd all sing these prayers from the Hallelujah Chorus at dinner time, Like, everybody would have their part. Oh, you know, the next one. Then we'd all sing. Now it's like, someone's always looking. You know, and sometimes they would even say goodnight. So all the things, you know, and I thought, we're going to sit around. We're, we're going to discuss politics and missions and 
global missions, not global warming, global missions, and we would sit around and we'd have these, you know, just all your ideals, and it never looks exactly how you think it's going to look. So I think the Lord wants us to let him shape the vision for our family and be flexible. How many of you also realize your families are coming from different places? Like some of you have a great family background. Like you could just naturally do what your parents would do, did, and your kids are going to do great. And some of you come from really dysfunctional homes. There's a lot of emotional scarring. You have to think, you have to think constantly about what to do because what you naturally do might be the wrong thing, which is kind of where I came from. Like what came natural to me wasn't the right thing. So I had to think a lot about externally as I was getting healing before I got healing. What do I need to do in this situation that would be healthy? So how many of you actually, I'm just curious, you feel like you came from a really healthy home, you could just copy how you were raised? That's amazing. And that's awesome. That's what people need. That's the example that we need to be able to watch other people. Because example is the most powerful. And you, when you come from healthy relational parents. But if you don't, the Lord sees your family background. He sees that you have more to overcome than somebody else. Like I had a lot to overcome as a parent from different areas. I had to think a lot and pray a lot and a lot to overcome. He sees your capacity. He sees your history. Larry says when he factors, when he plans your destiny, he factors in your stupidity. And I always say when he plans your destiny, he factors in your dysfunction. Like he knows where you're coming from. And he factors that in, and he has a way. Um, if you guys, I love Downton Abbey, and I know not a lot of men love Downton Abbey. How many ladies like Downton Abbey? Okay. Um, there's a scene in there where Mary, her mother, her husband has just died. And she's this kind of strong, austere kind of woman. And she's looking at her grandmother, and she says, um, I don't think I'm going to be a good mom. And she's like, I don't have that gooey kind of thing that moms have. And Granny looks at her in her wisdom and says, Mary, there's more than one kind of good mother. And I used to be like that. I used to look at people like, my personality's not conducive to this or that. But there's many, many kinds of awesome families and awesome parents. So, okay, number two, parenting is a life of sacrifice. Three John, third John four, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. But it's also um, a life of great reward. Like parenting, successful families take time, they take planning, they take hard work, they take perseverance and determination. And um, most people would, I think you, they come to the end of their life and they will tell you like their greatest joy and reward is how they handle the role of being a parent and a spouse. And their greatest sorrow and regret will have to do with how they handled family life. And so when you keep that ahead of you, that those are the really important things is your family. We don't have time for the things that don't matter. I wanted to read you something real quick that I put in here about, from, about family. Um, Edward Gibbons is considered like the number, maybe the number one historian about the decline and fall of Rome. And when you have a healthy family, you, healthy families are the building block of society, the church, the world. So to have a healthy family is a major, huge aspiration, and it makes a big, big impact. And this is what they say. This is what Edward Gibbons said caused the fall of Rome. Number five, the decline of religion. Number four, seeking pleasures that became increasingly hedonistic, violent, and immoral our country. Three, excessive taxes and government control and intervention. Two, the weakening of a sense of individual responsibility. Number one for the fall of Rome, the breakdown of the family structure. That's how important family is, and that's how big impact. Number one, breakdown of the family. So healthy family is an amazing thing, amazing goal that will have huge ripple effects. Um, Three, I put keep moving in the right direction. I want to read you this quote. Stephen Covey says this, good families, even great families, are off track 90% of the time. I tell that all the time to my class. The key is they have a destination and an end goal they're going for. So what's his point? It's not being perfectly on track. It's aiming for the end goal and readjusting yourself and aiming for what you want to see in your family. It's not being on track all the time. And I feel like that's so like, um, 
off track with one and then it's the other the next day. If you have four, there's always one you're worried about. So um, it's not being perfectly on track that produces great families. It's having a sense of destination and aiming for it that matters most creating a healthy family. And change happens incrementally. I see this all the time being part of the charismatic church after the evangelical. I think charismatics more, I hope I can say this, they, they want to see magic more. Like they want to see, boom, it happened. But really, change happens incrementally. And even these stories you hear when they had a, like a massive breakthrough, then you'll find out then the work after that. So when we get realistic expectations that change in your family happens bit by bit, you know, think long term. Okay, the next thing is be focused and intentional. This is really important. Survey after survey from Barna Group revealed that effective parents embrace parenting as their primary role in life. They may have other occupations, but parenting and raising a godly family is their, where all their best energy is directed. And it's the focus and the intentionality that sets them up for success. But now the enemy, he wants us, he wants to get us off track. He wants to get us off focus. So how does he do that? Well, one, he creates lots and lots of information out there. I mean, lots of information. That's not that he creates that. But there's so, all the options out there and all the distractions for parents and all the information where they're like a ping pong ball trying all kinds of different. I have one girl who's having incredible trouble with a three-year-old, and I asked her. And she said, well, my mother, and my mother sends me four parenting books a month. No wonder she's having so much trouble. So every month her mom sends her four more uh, ideas to try. Share, how to share. I mean, the titles were hilarious. Like a whole book on you don't have to share. Anyway, I don't know where she got that. But anyway, um, so overwork, overload, being distracted. The enemy tries to get us off focus because if you're off focus, um, you're going to have mediocre results. And it takes focus to parent. It takes focus to parent today. Because we've got more coming against us. If you parented before 1950, our government, our schools, our neighborhoods, our culture would undergird, for the most part, what you taught at home. Today, what you're teaching at home, if you're teaching biblical principles, is countercultural. So it's countercultural. Ben Carson, he's the neuro, have you guys heard of him? The neurosurgeon, the, the movie Gifted Hands is about him. I'm going to share some stories about him in a little bit. But he, he said the biggest risk to parenting today is all the other parents who aren't. So you have to focus today. You have to focus on parenting. But then the other side is trust Jesus, right? So one side is you really focus. You really determine. Ask the Lord to put a fire in you to put your best energy there. On the other side, who's responsible? Jesus. You trust the Lord. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Um, next thing is parenting is all about relationship, relationship, relationship. Your authority as a parent comes from relationship. And I, I've been like the family, the pastors here and being with the Duncans, I tell immediately they're relational families to watching their kids and them interact immediately. There's high, high, high relationship in there and you feel it. You enjoy being around them. Like they're relational. You can tell right away. So it's just encouraging to see families that operate like that but the beginning and the end of the bible is all about relationships starts with adam loss of relationship restoring the relationship it's all about relationship so in the long run your influence will not exceed your relationship with your child now i'm going to read you a couple quotes on this kids are going to seek to be like the person they are most attracted to so listen to this lack of relationship will lead to trouble because if you're having trouble with your kids you can be certain you are not alone. They are having trouble with you too. <laughs> and if your child is not in agreement to pull with you, it is vain to harness them to your rules. It does not work. So on the one hand, if, if you're in that place, and you know what, I've, we probably, most of us, maybe not them, but most of us have been in that place in seasons where there's misunderstanding. I know I've been there. I'm misunderstanding, and so we have friction in our relationship because there's misunderstanding, and so I become more authoritarian out of fear. You know, Then you get this spiral thing going, and you say, then we have to make the adjustments, though. When you're in a place that's not right, you, the parent, it doesn't, we, it doesn't say children train your parents. We have to make the first adjustment to get that relationship back on track with them. 
we're going to have to make adjustments to get it back on track. So your relational strength is what ultimately gives you authority. Same in the kingdom. Where does spiritual authority come from? Relationship with the Lord. People who are close to the Lord have real spiritual authority. The closer you are to Jesus, the more real authority you have. Our job in the kingdom is not to do works. It's to be close to Jesus. And then the works come out of that, right? The works come out of being close to Jesus. So um, describing relational parenting, it's just doing life together with your kids, being interested in things that interest them, being concerned about what, what they're concerned about, spending a lot of time with them, bragging on them, laughing with them, doing life together is what relational parenting is. It's, it's not some confusing, nebulous, weird thing. It's just doing life with your kids. If they're interested in something, you're interested in it. And you learn to parent relationally. Now, what I want to say is <laughs> when people think of relational parenting, a lot of times they think of like gooey Hallmark card. We only say positive things, no boundaries, and we sit around singing kumbaya. But real author parenting that's really relational has boundaries, training, and discipline. If you, one of the most unrelational things you can do as a parent is not train, not correct, and not discipline your children. And this is what the brain science is showing. The brain science is showing that overly permissive parenting is getting much worse results than authoritarian that's a little bit over the line. Because your brain is wired for structure, authority, boundaries. What kids need is authority today. And what the secular world is pushing is permissiveness off the charts. And if you say, I don't really feel comfortable parenting totally permissively, they get angry. I mean, it's so polarized now. I mean, it's scary to tell what you think. So, but real, so healthy parenting is administering authority in a relational, loving way. But it's not absence of correcting discipline, boundaries. It's not absence of those things. So and it, it, I think permissive parenting has different reasons people do it. Some people do it because they really don't care. So they let their kids do whatever. Like they really aren't that worried about their kids. And then other parents think, I can't control that kid anyway, so I'm just going to be permissive. And then they just, they let it go because they feel overwhelmed. And, they, and the other people feel like they've been taught love covers all. Like love just covers everything. So they parent permissively. So they don't put the boundaries in because they feel like love is enough for everything. They don't realize that love, God, God is relational. He's loving, but he is not permissive. And if you think he is, you'll find out he's not. And one day I was praying and I was really disappointed about things I was seeing in the, you know, leadership and somewhere and it was just things you just see in church sometimes. And I was really disappointed. And the Lord literally spoke to me. And he said, I am not permissive with my church. In other words, you may see things that really aren't right right now. But it doesn't mean they're not going to be corrected. Because you don't see them corrected today. So he said, I am not permissive with my church. And you know, it really actually brought security to me. Okay, you're in charge. And you're not permissive. Yay. So. Am I making sense? Because I don't want to, if I emphasize one side too much, then y'all misunderstand me. I don't, I don't want to be misunderstood by what I'm saying about permissiveness. But permissive parenting creates insecurity in kids because they feel unloved. They get confused. Since the brain is wired for structure, when the kids are running the home, it creates a lot of, uh, a lot of anxiety. It, they, they, kids do better under strong parenting with love. And then when they're little, they get less choices. I'm not a, I don't believe in lots of choices when they're tiny. I believe the funnel. You, like, give them choices, and the older they get, the more obedient. You teach obedience, and as they're maturing, you give more and more and more choices as they get older, more and more freedom. We're going to talk about that, too, in a minute. But um, so if you aren't a permissive parent, I mean, if you aren't relational, like you don't know how to be relational, which has partly been a problem for me, what will you live in if you're not a relational parent? Task or performance? And what's task parenting? What, what exemplifies task parenting? Anxiety, lists, what's what you do for them, not being with them, got to solve the problem. Got to, it's, it's, it's characterized by doing. And then perform, performance parents produce performing kids. And it's usually because they feel an inadequacy. Like, I can't 
for some reason I can't really measure up and I don't want to be exposed. So they, they perform, they're performing for love and they put that on their kids and then on it on goes right on down the line. But how many, if you're task oriented, um, if I told you the brain science shows that relational people get more done than task oriented people, would you believe that? What if I let go of task? Who's going to get all the stuff done? Relational people actually get a lot more done because they just do the stuff. And then if someone comes into their office, they don't need to say, when's this creep leaving so I can get the rest of my stuff done. They actually can visit with them for a minute. And then when they leave, they just move on to the next thing. Like when you're really relational, your relational circuits are on, like you are attuned and connected. You, it, though, you don't have anxiety. You don't have, you don't have to solve the problem. You're at peace. Your relational circuits are on. And so you actually get more done, not less. Now, it doesn't mean you can't make a list. But you know what I mean by being list, like driven by the list, right? I used to be like that, and I mean, God has healed me so much in the last uh, 10 years. I mean, I can be in an airport and be talking to somebody and forget the flight, so we know there's healing. Um, <laughs> but when you're, n when you're in relational, just think about when the presence of God is strong. Are you worried about anything? What do you feel? Peace. No worry. It's going to work out. Don't need to figure it out. Don't need to solve it. When you're, the presence that is relational. That's what it feels like to be relational. So that's what you want with your kids. You want to be a relational parent and have your circuits on and parent in love, but you want to have authority. You want to parent with authority as well. Um, let's see. Next thing, enjoy parenting. If you're not a perfect parent, but you enjoy parenting, the odds are your kids are going to come out well. If the joy of the Lord is a Christian strength, then the joy of the parent is the child's strength. So if you enjoy parenting, what do you get? Joy in the home. So I told you, like, I was doing an inner healing session with Dr. Curlin, and um, at the end of the session, and I had, it was something with a, a teenager, I just, I had anxiety from some stuff they were doing, and um, at the end, I saw Larry Randolph was, like, in my inner healing session, like, his face. And I was like, what are you doing in my inner healing session? He's a close friend of ours. I'm like, wait a minute. Um, and then immediately I thought, laughter. Like, Larry, what do you think of when you think of Larry if you've heard him? He's hilarious. You laugh. You feel lighthearted around him. So I immediately the Lord said, I love humor. Like, I heard it real clear. I love humor, and I am predominantly lighthearted. And I immediately knew the Lord was saying, like, you don't have to worry about this. I got it. Like, even though it seems big, I got it. Just relax. This is lighthearted. Trust me. Trust me. And, and I read, I asked this one lady what she wished she had done more, and she said, I wish we had laughed more in our home. Like, your kids are going to want to come home to follow Jesus if there's no joy at home. So enjoy parenting. Let's just pray right there. Lord, we just pray right now. I pray, God, that right now that you would cause to sweep across this room, and I pray you would cause an anointing to come in our homes, that it's supernatural, that we can enjoy our children, enjoy parenting, enjoy our grandkids, not worry, Lord. I pray that you'd move us into relational parenting, God, and free us from task and anxiety and performance, Lord. I pray that you would so move and... Just let your joy be our strength and let our joy be their strength so that we can show them what you're like, Lord, a proper understanding of you. Okay, um, next thing is model what you want to see in your kids. Tell somebody next to you, example, hold on, wait a minute. Um, if I'm thinking of something else for a second, my mind goes, um, there's nothing more powerful than example. Say that to somebody. There's nothing more powerful than example. Your kids are going to think and act a lot like you think and act because they get a lot from you. So I always tell people, if you want a little revival in your kid's life, you've got to have a big revival in yours. If you want hardworking kids, you've got to work hard. You hear parents all the time, they don't pick up their room, and then the mom doesn't pick up anything either. So it's like you can't ask them to pick up if you don't pick up. And then you can't ask them to work hard at school if you don't work hard. And you can't ask them to be passionate about something if you're not passionate about something. So they're, they're, little, they're all the time, their little radars are just all the time going, picking up, well, what, what are you doing? They pick up all the time what we're doing. They learn about how to live by watching us. So um, if, you, if you want them to be positive, be positive. Um, 
if you want them to break through, you got to break through. I, I tell in that finding your passion chapter with the kids, I tell parents, if you don't have a passion, that's one of the first things you do. Like, not do what some parents do where you make your passion, you play golf and you don't t- take care of your kids. But I'm talking about they need to see, like, you're passionate about things and you develop yourself. And then it makes them realize that's what we do. We find what we're great at and we go for it because I see mom and dad live like that. So, um, so we're, we're being, what we do is not as important as who we are when it comes to parenting. We got to be the right people. Okay, and then, okay, the modeling. It's hard to model if you don't have healing in your life. So my next principle is seek your own healing. Like some of you don't have as much that you need to seek, but for those of us who do, deal with your places of woundedness, the lies you believe. We all believe lies, and we all have places that still need to be healed. So keep working on those. The greatest indication as to whether your kids are going to overcome their stuff and you're going to parent successfully is whether you deal with your life. And so I wish parenting were so easy we could just all find some canned parenting curriculum and teach it to our kids and do it, but it doesn't work like that because we have past things. And then sometimes things even happen to your kids. Like we've had stuff happen to our kids in Romania that's out of our control that tweaked some of them in ways, and there's nothing we could do except trust the Lord. But there's no situation that he doesn't have healing for and solutions for. So we watched him. We watched him do healing. And so we all have places like that to trust him for. But so seeking healing where you need to seek healing. And I always say, just ask the Lord, Lord, is there anything in my life that I need to understand or that I need to deal with? Just ask that regularly to the Lord. And sometimes when I feel emotions that aren't appropriate, like I feel anger, I ask the Lord, well, where is that coming from? Like, help me understand, because we know anger is a secondary emotion. It's usually coming from ang- fear or anxiety. So I ask the Lord, like, where is, that, where is that coming from? And then listen to the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord, where is that coming from in my life? So, because um, you know your kids are going to grow up to be a lot like you. So you want to keep getting healing in your own life. Um, this is cool about brain science. I love, Dr. Curlin's taught me a ton, and I've been reading on it about the, he calls it, uh, it's called neuro sci- interpersonal neurobiology. But it's basically the, all the booming um, information they have about how the brain develops is actually really fascinating, interesting. But they know this about brain science. If you break through as a parent, even your kids are grown and out of your home. You break through in an area. Your child has, will have a much easier time breaking through in that area. Isn't that amazing? That reminds me of like Roger Bannister, 1953. They said he can, no one could break the four-minute mile. They said it was like physically impossible to break the four-minute mile. Well, Roger Bannister broke it. I think four months later, John Laddie broke it. And then within two years, 30 men had broken the four-minute mile. And they have study after study that like it, that's what happens. And because you're connected through your line with your kids. So you may be 70 and you break through with something emotionally in your life, and you set your kids up to break through. You break through perfectionism, anything that God, the Holy Spirit would want to heal in you, you set them up to break through much easier. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's so encouraging. I think especially if you're not around your kids as much anymore, and you're not raising them anymore at home. Um, So next thing, successful parents spend lots of time with their children. Number two mistake made by parents, according to Barna studies, among young adults when they interviewed them, was not spending enough time with their children. And I'll tell you what number one is in a minute, but number two is not spending enough time. Kids, if you want to really communicate how much you value them, then give them your time. I mean, they notice that when you put things down and you just hang out with them. Even though I'm not great because of my task or any of this is still kind of there in some areas, I'm not great at games, but I like try to play them with the kids. (laughs) Like, I don't like to play Monopoly, really. But, um, but I'll try to do those, and the kids, like, to them, it just shows them, like, hey, mom's not that great at this yet, but she's trying, you know. So, um, um, and the, the surveys also showed successful families spend about 90 to 120 minutes each day in dialogue with their children. The average family registered less than 15 minutes a day. And this is another tip. With relationships, slow is fast, and fast is slow. So spending time with your kids. Next principle, train your children according to their unique bent. 
Proverbs 22, 6, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Have you guys heard this quote, when everyone thinks alike, no one thinks very much? Yeah. yeah. So it's really, your ki- children are completely unique. And the Barna Group study showed that, everyone, that parents were all acknowledging, yes, uh, one size fits all parenting doesn't work very well, but then they would all go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> it's a lot of work to be a student of your child. So you want to figure out, like, for instance, I'll give you an example in our house. Like if you, or just a general example, if you have a child that's prone to laziness, you're going to want to encourage them. Like, oh, they're not, don't just say they're laid back. You want to encourage them to work harder, to be, do more excellent. If you have a child who's perfectionistic, uptight, has to get things perfect, you want to encourage them to n- relax, don't worry so much about the outcome. You're always, you're knowing your child's strength and weakness, and then you're helping train them in those ways. And the more healed you are, the more you can see. If you've got a lot of woundedness in your life, it's going to be hard for you to see where your child's at. The more healing you get, the more understanding you're going to get for your children. Like Anna is very right-brained and musical. Like she pretty much came out singing and prophetic, and but she's afraid of things. Like she's kind of, she'll shrink back about trying something. Like she doesn't like to make, call the bank or anything because she, she's very, she learns differently from other kids, so she feels stupid when she asks questions. Like that's just where she's at right now. So, but she could be awesome on a stage, <laughs> but intellectually she's a little bit intimidated or she's intimidated to take initiative sometimes. So anyway, we were down interviewing, we were going down to visit colleges and we were at this huge music school in Southern California. And the guy over all 600 music students happened to walk through the office. And I had told her now, if anybody asks you to sing, she's got this beautiful, highest, she has a, I forgot what it's called, um, opera voice, but it's the highest on the register, coloratura opera voice. And um, she, this guy had come through and he said, oh, is Anna here today? We were just on campus for a half a day. And he said, well, will you sing for me? And she was about to say no. And I said, oh, yeah, she will. <laughs> she's like, she's to go. I said, she'll be glad to. She's like, I don't have a song. I said, it's okay. So we went into his office, and he went, he had this big mahogany office. He was really kind of intimidating, but he said, well, can you find it on, uh, you know, the music on YouTube, and it was, oh, listen, I mean, uh, la, 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 la. Anyway, so she found the music part on YouTube, and like, I literally thought she was going to fall over. I was so nervous, too, but then she just sat in his office, and he's like, okay, begin, you know, and then she like sang, and then he goes, hmm, he goes, how much money do you need to come here? Yeah, he gave her their biggest scholarship. Well, as a parent, I really wanted to just, in my, I wanted to say, oh, that's okay. But we would never be down there again, you know, for a long time. So I pushed Anna because I knew she needed to do it, even though she's 19 years old. And then later she's like, thanks, Mom. She didn't know, like, Wesley's getting all these academic scholarships for academics and for sports, and Anna didn't know that developing her gift, which was her voice, we developed her gift, and we didn't focus as much on academics with her, that her gift was worth money. It was so amazing for her to see. It was so awesome. Yeah, it was so, so cool. So anyway, so then, and then, like, Wesley's a natural leader, but he, he's our, everyone just likes to follow Wes. Like, uh, he's just amazing, but... He doesn't like confrontation. So what Jeff did is he signed him up for refing, for soccer refing. Because he said, I mean, how, how good a leader can you be if you cannot confront? You know, so Jeff signs him up for refing. This is like three years ago. And Christian, the middle son who's not athletic, loves to have authority. So he was all excited about refing. And I said, Christian, what are you going to do when, like, those mean parents on the side are like, they, you know, they scream at you every time you make a bad call. I feel bad for the refs because, like, they're doing the best they can, and the parents are screaming at them. And uh, so I said, Christian, what are you going to do, like, when the parents yell at you? He goes, I'm going to tell them. And Christian has a little bit of a lisp. He said, I'm going to tell them, lady, I am the wep of this game. <laughs> <laughs> Christian is beyond hilarious. You just have to know him. Um, he was the one when they'd call home, and I'd be like, I'm not answering the phone, because you know, like, never know what he's going to do. Like, one day he flushed all the toilets in the bathroom, and then it flowed out down the Bethel School hallway. I'm on the board there. And I was like, no, I'm not answering the phone. Christian's probably done something again. But anyway, <laughs> he was, like, so curious, and he flushed them all to see what would happen. I'm like, great. Okay. Um, and then one time, he was sitting, like, in second grade. Some kid's lunch looked great to him, and he just gobbled it up. And then when they call, hey, Mrs. Shoop, I'm on the board. 
can you come and replace Christian at lunch? Christian, like, ate another kid's lunch. And when I got there, Christian was tears. I don't know what it came over me, Mom. I just looked at it. It looked so good, and I just ate it. <laughs> so he's just the one. You never know what Christian's going to do next. But anyway. And then Josh is like type A. Everything's black and white. He's like, Christian, now, if you would listen better. And co-. He's like, I hear him at night coaching him how to be a good kid. Um, <laughs> how to not get in trouble. Um, so parenting, unique, parent your kids according to their unique personality and ask the Lord to show you you're, you're a student of your kid like that. Um, and Anna's like not as discerning with guys, so Jeff's like way more protective. She's awesomely beautiful. And so we've had, like that's where all my gray hair came from, her being in high school. And like, so Jeff finally told her, no more football players are coming across the threshold. of the, Only soccer and golf. Like, I don't know what it was. One, one kid came over, and he, he was mesmerized by Anna, and he's like fifth generation Stanford, and he straight-A student, captain of the football team, and he, he knew he couldn't go anywhere with Anna alone. That's Jeff's, like, you can't go, take Anna anywhere alone. So he came over to eat dinner with us, and he was trying to impress Jeff. And he, well, I forgot, Jeff goes, who's your favorite president? I'm like, Jeff, like, really? He's like, he's just a senior don't grill him so Jeff's like who's your favorite president and like the kid goes Mr. Shoop like you're you're intense and then and then then he's telling him like he's saying I studied I'm sorry three years of Russian or whatever and like Jeff goes who would why would anyone study Russian I'm like kicking Jeff under the table (laughs) this poor kid but anyway all that to say in humor we've been more careful with her because she's a little more naive than the other kids like she just she's right-brained and um so we've been more protective in the guy area. Okay, next principle. Successful parents help their kids discover their innate passions and gifting. One of the greatest things you can do for your kids is help them discover what they're great at and then what they're naturally gifted at and what they love. Because you can be gifted at something and hate it, or you can love something and not be good at it. So we, but I believe every kid has, like, greatness in them. I studied that book, The Element, by Sir Ken Robinson, the creativity expert from England. And he basically has so much amazing stuff on how, like, talents, some talents are so hidden underneath that you really have to experiment and dig, and then you find out, like, what someone's gifted. It takes some work sometimes. So we've been praying, like, Lord, show us what our kids are great at and help us discover it. So I think every kid is born like that to have do great things. Um, and I think some of the low self-esteem you see today is like kids not developed. They haven't found what they're great at. And so they're bored. They're in school doing things counter to the way they're naturally made. And they haven't developed anything. They haven't found something I'm great at. Like kids want to be great at something. So um, you want to help them discover that. Um, again, Christian, for instance, he is like this natural little businessman reading Kiyosaki. But he was reading Fortune magazine, I would say, when he was, was he nine, nine and a half? He was reading it real quick. He read the bios real quick of the billionaires. He went through and he read the bios of each billionaire. And then he goes, Mom, we got to get out a wedding. <laughs> he goes, the billionaires live in Tokyo, New York, Japan, London. They do not live in wedding. <laughs> <laughs> he just, no, 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 they live here. It was hilarious. And then he, this is so funny, and he, uh, I heard him, like, a couple days ago, I came in, and he was on the phone with Wells Fargo, and he's like, "Um, I'm trying to need some help with my online banking. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what kid calls at that age for help with his online banking? Um, But um, he is super funny. And then he went, I saw him, I caught him in, he had gone into the bookstore, and he saw somebody looking at books, so he picked up my book, and he just, like, stood right next to him. This is a great book. This would be Christian. And so the, per- the person was like, oh, really? Like, what's it about? And he's like, so he, like, told him, he was the forewords. He, like, told him. So they went and bought, they got in line with my book. And then as Christian's going out, the man, like, looked at the back cover, and he goes, that's your mom! He's like, <laughs> but only Christian. So, um, and he's just so relational off the charts. He's so relational and great, great with people. But he's not great at sports, so he keeps trying new sports. And he's finally landed on golf because golf, like, he just, he's getting better bit by bit, but he's landed on golf. Um, next thing, Anna is very musical. And when she was young, someone came up to us and they said, you know, auditions for Annie are coming up in Reading. So I took Anna to try out, and lo and behold, she got the role of Annie. And, like, God, it's amazing how... 
the Lord wants you to know what your kid. So someone literally came up to us and said, Anna should try out for Annie. And then she would try it out for Sound of Music the next year, and there were 200 kids that tried out for the, the seven Von Trapp kids. And they were all like, and the, the director already knew the other kids much better than Anna. And then when we tried out, the other, uh, Anna was last two for Louisa. And um, the director said, he, so Anna did not get picked. But I went to bed that night because he knew the other girl way better. And I thought she did better in tryouts, but the Lord said, Anna's going to get the part. I thought, that's weird. I woke up, and he said, Anna's getting the part of Louisa. So I didn't say anything to her, but r the girl dropped her part because she wanted to go on vacation or something, and Anna got Louisa. Like, the, it's amazing how God works things for our kids. I'm just, I've seen it over and over. Like, Wesley, for instance, if you watch him when they're little, you can get real signs. I have a whole, whole bunch of tips on finding their passion. When Wesley was five years old, he watched Chariots of Fire, and he said, Mom, you know what my favorite line is? He said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Like, he is literally five years old. I'm like, that is strange. Like, that's young. And he has gone from soccer. He's on soccer scholarship to Taylor. He, he, then he played golf. And at 16, he decided he wanted to take up golf. And he played golf probably eight hours a day. And I said, Wes, like, you've never played. You're not going to make the team at U Prep." He played for two weeks, eight or nine hours a day in thunderstorms. And, and he made the team at number nine. And by the two months later, he had broken 80 and was number two on the team. Like, he just, his, 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 he'll work really hard at sports, too. But anyway, it's just fun. God so wants you to know your kids. Like, Josh is a really strong leader. He has a lot of compassion. He has a spiritual antenna. Like, he just sees things. Um, I think I told this on the video I did with Bill. But when he was really little, like, Josh sees things in black and white. We were watching The Phantom of the Opera. And there's a little part where the guy, like, moons the audience. So Josh, like, shoots up off the couch at three, and he goes, that man does not know God, and God does not know him. <laughs> and we're like, whoa. I mean, he is this intense. He, we used to take him into service at Bethel. We'd take him, and he goes, he'd come in, and where the blue birds? Where are the blue birds? I'm like, blue birds on the basketball goals. Like, in the service where Bill was speaking, he would see, I guess, Bob Jones said they're blue, a lot of angels. But he would always be pointing at the blue birds up there all over when he was little. And we were like, where are they? We don't see them. But anyway, and then he, he's just hilarious. He's the one with the ambulance thing. And then he, one day he woke up from home. It was like he was four at this time, and he was jumping around the house. Like two hours later, leaping, leaping. I mean, no exaggeration. I'm like, what? after two hours, I'm like, why are you leaping all over the house? He said, well, cousin, he said, an angel came to my room, and he said, to rejoice in the Lord. And so this is, he said, he said, I saw God. So Christian gets right in his face, and he goes, Joshua, you cannot see the face of God and live. <laughs> <laughs> and I am not kidding. Like, Josh goes, Rawr! like, all of a sudden, all that anointing left. He got so mad. But anyway, Josh is the one, like my mom said, my mom has a calendar with Michelangelo pictures on it. And then in May, you know, then one of the pictures, the Sistine Chapel ceiling with some of the naked, you know, like the Fresno paintings that Josh, when that month was over and he turned, Josh goes, phew. He goes, I sure am glad that month is over, Oma. <laughs> <laughs> he's just so, he's so serious. And then one time, he was watching a movie. We had put him to sleep at 2, and he had fallen asleep, and there were, we were watching a movie, and Jeff was with him at this point, and this, there was a scene depicting discrimination, and someone got up, and they threw an egg in a black man's face. Josh was asleep. I am not kidding. Shot up off the floor and went, freedom! Freedom! <laughs> He's, like, shouting at the television. Like, he has always, always done stuff like that to where we are just like... He is, he's got this spiritual antenna. It's just going all the time. That he just sees things, and he, he has a heart for justice. And Larry Randolph calls him the judge. Because <laughs> he's so, he's kind of, we do have to teach him he's not in charge of everybody, and that he can't be legalistic and all that, because he just sees things. So, um, anyway, um, okay, so I think I'm probably going to wind it down there. One other thing I want to say, and we can do questions, and... Um, I should probably wind it down. Um, we'll just, because I've got some more we'll do another day. It's just um, 
teaching your kids, like looking at what character traits you want to see in them long term, um, that you want to see in your kids like at 21. And one of the important things is like obedience, self-control, um, forgiveness, a heart for, of course, we want them all to be close to Jesus. But if you just map out like what things are important, because it's important for kids to learn obedience, because if they don't obey, if you don't learn to obey, then when God tells them to do something, they won't obey. So you got to think about what kind of things they need to learn to forgive others, they need to learn to serve. Just ma- sitting down and thinking, like, what areas do I want to train them in? Like, what your kids at 2, they'll be at 12 magnified. What they're at 3, they'll be 13. They don't grow out of things. That's a lie. Like, you train. They grow out of some things naturally, but a lot of things, they just stay there unless you train. So then my last would just be... We can continue on Saturday, but just training your kids and thinking about what, ask the Lord to show you what is important for us to train our kids in. So um, anyway, I have lots more stories, but, and I thought maybe on Saturday we could pray just some things the Lord showed me prophetically for you guys, and, uh, and we'll just pick it up there. Okay, thank you. My task orientation kept coming out because the whole time she was speaking, this was over to the right-hand side, and I kept wanting to come over and push it and get it in the center. Or is that OD, OC, <laughs> OCD <laughs> to the max, you know? Was that not powerful? Come on, was that not good? Come on, give, give, give a shout-out. That's, that's awesome. Awesome, man. It's just, um, just such, a, such a great... It's such a great beginning tonight, and it is just the beginning. Um, Lieutenant General Pat Granana is here on the front row uh, with his wife, and he's going to be with us tomorrow morning. Come on, stand up and just say hello to the people this morning, would you? Actually, this is in the evening right now. You're in the morning. Is it, is it already morning? I, I can't wait to be with you tomorrow. Blessings to you all. Thank you. Um, he is... Um, He's the CEO of uh, Focus on the Family, and we got to have a great time. Um, we went over with uh, Carl and Judith and spent some time at their house in San Antonio and just had an incredible moment. And he's already, he came tonight, he, he, he came through breakthrough, had all kinds of back issues. First thing Duncan did, laid hands on him. He got hit with the spirit over in the in the vineyard room and started going back and got his back healed. So can we give God some praise right now? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it's just it's just awesome and and the the weekend is going to continue to to just build and and God is going to teach us how to raise a family in a revival culture. And just to move into a dimension of uh, the sustainability of uh, there, there is one right there, just enjoying the Lord, glory. <laughs> the kids have been let out. I, I would like to receive an offering this evening. I, I'm going to ask uh, one of our associate pastors here to just come on up, if he would. Hey, my, my, my brother back here in the yellow. Would you mind coming up here and receiving the evening offering? Pastor Greg, y'all, y'all, get, y'all give it up for Pastor Greg tonight as he comes, receive his song. <laughs> All right, get that, that money out. Shirt, man. I see you. Okay. All right, praise God. It is time to give on tonight. Amen. Dig deep. Dig really deep. Really deep. Get your Louis Vuittons out, your coaches. Come on. Look in your St. John pockets. Come on, get that money out. No. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? And it's time for us to give cheerfully on tonight. Actually, our doorkeepers to get, their, uh, get, the, get the baskets together. Oh, this way? We're going to bring our offering. Come on, stand to your feet. Father, we thank you for the offering that we're about to receive. Father God, we ask you, God, that the offering be used, God, for the furtherance of your kingdom on tonight. We ask you, God, that the offering that is received tonight, God, bless your people, God. We ask you, God, that the offering that, re- that is received tonight be used, God, to further this house, that we'll have more times of fellowship as this, God, that we'll develop into the people that you've called for us to be. Right now, God, let your blessings, God, pour upon your people, God, some 30, some 60, some even 100 fold. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Come from where you are. Give as God is blessed unto you on tonight. Amen. 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 Can we have some offering giving music? <laughs> People give when they have good music to listen to. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. We're getting there. Just hang in there. Just keep bringing the money. Just keep bringing the money. This is how we do it. We just hold you out. Uh huh. Jesus, your love is so amazing. And this joy, I can't explain it. I'm caught up in the fellowship. I'm caught up in your fellowship. Jesus, your love is so amazing. Joy, I can't explain it. All right, here we go. Sing Jesus. Jesus, your love is so amazing. And this joy can't explain it. I'm caught up in the fellowship. Yes, I'm caught up in the fellowship. Jesus, your love is so amazing. And this joy can't explain it. I'm caught up in your fellowship. Yes, I'm caught up in your fellowship. Jesus, your love is so amazing. And this joy, and this joy can't explain it. I'm caught up in the fellowship. Yes, I'm caught up in your fellowship. Jesus, your love is so amazing. And this joy can't explain it. I'm caught up in the fellowship. Sing, you're the one, you're the one, there you go again, lifting my heart, lifting my head, and hope is rising as I see you smiling, you're the one, there you go again, lifting my heart, lifting my head, and hope is rising as I see you
He lost me. Am I found? Oh, I've been found. Hallelujah. <laughs> I was lost, but now I'm found. God bless you all. It's been a great night. Hug somebody's neck, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow night, Duncan's going to be with us, and tomorrow morning, well, you already heard. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow.